Well, it's it's uh, it's wonderful to to be here to celebrate uh, Ilya Rips's birthday. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I I I I knew about Ilya Rips uh, decades before I met him because he was. Uh, I, I read uh, Saul Bellow's book uh, to Jerusalem and back, and there's a whole whole passage about uh, uh, you know meeting him and how fascinating it was to meet a, a mathematical genius and. Uh, so he was he was a legend to me for many years. Many people talked to me about him, and uh, uh, I, I never thought that he would get interested in a conjecture that I'd posed, but he did, and uh, and uh, and and he proved it. So so it's it's wonderful to have a chance to have interacted with him. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk today about a problem which uh, at least I think of as being motivated by number theory. That may seem funny because I'm not a number theorist, but I've always, uh, part of me has always wished that I were. So uh, let me begin with the definition of a, uh, of a quaternion algebra. Uh, so it's it's an algebra over a field uh, K, which uh, at least in the applications will always have characteristic zero, <coughs> and so it's a um, it's it's a it's an associative algebra B over K. It's four-dimensional as a vector space over, over K. <coughs> and, um, and it has a basis, one, which of course means the identity of the algebra, multiplicative identity, IJK, and these satisfy the, the relations uh, I squared equals alpha, J squared equals beta, IJ equals K, and JI equals minus K, where alpha and beta are two non-zero elements of K. And from, from these relations, it's easy to uh, determine the rest of the uh, multiplication table using associativity and so on. <coughs> so, uh, two, fa two familiar examples, if we take K equals R, we can take uh, <coughs> we can take alpha and beta uh, both to be minus one, and then uh, by definition uh, B is the Hamiltonian quaternions. <coughs> uh, the the other basic example um, it, again we take k equals r, but now we take uh, let's say alpha equals minus one, beta equals one. And then it's an easy exercise to show that B is isomorphic to the ring of two by two matrices over, over R. And these are the only two uh, quaternion algebras over the real numbers up to isomorphism. Now, uh, <coughs> more generally, uh, more, more generally, for any K, for any uh, field K in any quaternion algebra B, B is uh, is is either it's either a division algebra, as in the case of the Hamiltonian quaternions, or is uh, is isomorphic to uh, to the matrix algebra. And in fact, uh, this uh, always happens 
if k is algebraically closed. Okay, so the um, number of theoretic objects that I'll be looking at today <coughs> are quaternion algebras over, over a number field. So number field just means, of course, a, a finite extension of Q. So if K is a number field and if... Uh, if let's say B is the case I'm really, the interesting case is when it's a division quaternion algebra as opposed to being a, a matrix algebra. Well, because it's a division algebra, <coughs> in particular it's a, uh, in particular it's a finite dimensional vector space over, uh, over Q because K is itself a finite extension of Q. So, uh, so the, the way I think of it, and again, I, I really have no idea if this is the way a number theorist would look at it, but the, the point of view I've settled on is that B is a, uh, a non-commutative analog of a number field. So, the, so what you can try to do is take some of the basic concepts that one looks at in studying number fields and look for their analogs in the case of uh, in the case of these quaternion algebras. So one of the very first things that you look at one of the very first things you look at in um, <coughs> in the case of a of a number field. Is the, is the ring of integers. So, so uh, this, this is just the uh, elements of the number field that satisfy uh, m m um, a monic polynomial with, uh, with integer coefficients. Uh, now, it, that doesn't actually have a canonical analog in the case of a quaternion algebra. over a number field. That is to say, instead of one counterpart of the ring of integers, in general you have many. <coughs> and uh, these are the so-called maximal orders. So I think I'll just quickly write down the definition. So. Um, so remember B, so let's say B, uh, oh, okay. Uh, so I guess this would be a number field, let's say, I don't know, E, and uh, quaternion algebra, let's say B, the so maximal orders in B. So I mentioned that B is in particular a finite, uh, uh, finite dimensional Q vector space. So an, an order in such a thing is a subring Um, uh, which is additively generated by a Q basis. So as an additive group, it's generated by a, by a Q basis. In this case, for B. <coughs> now, so of course, maximals simply means that it's an order which is not uh, contained in any strictly bigger order. Uh, so for the ring of integers, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to show that there's exactly, I'm sorry, for a number field rather, it's easy to show that there's exactly one maximal order and that it is the ring of integers. Uh, so in, in general here you have many. Well, okay, that's fine. You, you, li you live with that. So instead of just studying one thing, you study, you try to study all of them. <coughs> and another almost uh, uh, equally basic object in the case of a number field is, uh, so let's say O is the ring of integers. So we can look at uh, O star, which is the, uh, the units of O. So the elements of O that, that have inverses, multiplicative inverses in O. And uh, well, here, uh, I, uh, 
I'm putting this in quotes because it doesn't exactly match the formal definition that I'm going to give in a minute, but roughly speaking, these are called uh, arithmetic groups. <coughs> so these are, these are um, what I really mean by this is that I mean, I mean subgroups of, well, of the multiplicative group of B. Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely always thinking of this as a division quaternion algebra, okay? So subgroups of the multiplicative group of B. So of course that's just the non-zero elements of B which form a group under multiplication, <coughs> which are um, uh, 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 commensurable with the uh, group of units of, of some maximal order. So it makes perfectly good sense, I mean, the, to, to look at the group of units. It's still a group. It's no longer abelian. And uh, <coughs> for reasons that I'll say a word about in just a second, instead of looking at the actual group of units, it's more natural to look at things that are commensurable with it. So what does that mean? So uh, if, two, if you take two groups, two subgroups in general of a group gamma, I think Vincent mentioned this the other day, A and B are, are commensurable if their intersection has finite index in both A and B. So they're sort of the same up to finite index. So <coughs> I guess the way I've come to think about why these why these more general things than just the uh, unit, uh, units in the, um, uh, in the maximal order uh, are the natural thing to look at is, well, if you go back to the number field case, <coughs> if you look at the units in O, then that's the, I, I, uh, yeah, <coughs> that's the unique maximal um, subgroup of, uh, of, um, of, of E star in its commensurability class. So, you know, you can, it's, it's, it's definitely interesting to look at finite index subgroups of this, but there's one natural one, which is the biggest one. Here, there is no unique maximal thing in the commensurability class. There are lots of them. So instead of just looking, instead of just looking at a fixed thing now, we look at all the things that are commensurable uh, with, uh, with this group. So what I'm going to be trying to illustrate today is that you can study uh, these groups using, using geometry and topology. And uh, they are, of course, groups that are, that are naturally defined in an algebraic context, and you're using geometry to study them. So I guess that's geometric group theory. Anyway, uh, uh, and, and as we'll see, uh, well, okay. All right, so, um, so uh, let me talk about the, the sort of first step here in making contact with, with, with geometry. <coughs> so, uh, right, so, so let's, say, um, let's say B is a, uh, for example, a division uh, quaternion algebra over a number field K. And uh, so I guess, yeah, so I guess I'm going to use O for some uh, maximal order. So if we look at... Um, if we look at B tensor with, uh, oh, sorry. Let me now make an assumption. So assume, assume that K has a unique complex place. So what I mean by that is that there's a homomorphism 
from K, uh, a field homomorphism from K into C. Of course, that's automatically injective. <coughs> uh, which uh, does not map it into into R, so it's generally it's genuinely complex instead of instead of uh, a real uh, embedding in disguise, and assume that this thing is unique up to con complex conjugation. So if you if you fix the um, if you fix the degree of k over over the rational numbers, there's a positive probability that a given that a given field of that degree will have um, will, will have a unique uh, complex place in that sense. So when there's a unique complex place, well, we choose it within its complex conjugacy class, which is a trivial matter, and then uh, so that means we can now identify. K with a subfield of C, and now it's 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 purely formal to show that if I take the that if I extend the field of scalars, so I look at the tensor product of B with C over K, <coughs> that inherits the structure of an algebra, and in fact it's a it's a quaternion algebra. But uh, well, over C now, okay? But C was algebraically closed, so as I mentioned before, this is actually iso isomorphic to um, the two by two matrices over C. And so, uh, uh, and, and you know, this, this isomorphism is, uh, you know, it's unique up to sort of conjugation by GL2C, I guess. So, um, so, so B is then, uh, identified with a subring of M2 of C and uh, well in fact so is uh, so is O I guess and that means that the group of units of O is identified well. The units of, of M2 of C are just GL2C. Okay. So O star is now identified with a subgroup of, of GL2C. <coughs> mm. Okay, uh, well, uh, now I'm going to make a further assumption on the field. Uh, no, not an assumption on the field, but rather an assumption on the quaternion algebra. So now I'm going to assume, and again, this happens for many quaternion algebras. So assume that uh, B ramifies, I'll explain in a second what that means, at every real place. Of, of K, so that means that for every, well, embedding or, or homomorphism, let's use the word embedding, just emphasize that it's really something that allows us to identify K with a, with a subfield of R. We can do the same construction we did here. We can look at B tensor uh, R over K, so again, it's a quaternion algebra over R. <coughs> so a priori, it could be either the um, it could be either the two by two matrices over R, or it could be the Hamiltonian quaternions. And I'm assuming that it's always the Hamiltonian quaternions. And uh, well, that's that's a, that's an assumption that, as I say, it again, it happens in. in uh, a, a significant percentage of, of examples. And wh when it happens, so in this case, the image of, of O star in, in GL2C 
and hence also in uh, when you projectivize in PGL2C, dividing out by the center, <coughs> uh, is discrete. Uh, this is an elementary fact. You can, you know, you can give a, you know, with a small amount of time, you can prove it using only what you would see in a graduate uh, Galois theory course. Uh, the really deep fact is, uh, which is deep number theory, is that in fact, um, is that in fact, uh, the image of O star is a lattice which is to say it has finite co-volume. Uh, so let me, call, let me give a name to this. Uh, let me in fact give a name, uh, I think I call it um, uh, gamma O zero. Of, of O star in, in PGL2C uh, is in fact a lattice. So it has finite co-volume, which you can define abstractly in terms of our measure, but the way I really think about it is if you think of PGL2C as the orientation preserving isometries of hyperbolic three space, then uh, H3 mod gamma O uh, zero is in fact uh, is, um, <clears throat> well, let me just say slightly vaguely, has finite volume. So the, the point is that if, if it happened that this were torsion free, which it's not, then, uh, then this quotient would be a hyperbolic three manifold. Uh, but because it's, um, because it has a torsion in general, uh, I mean, actually this thing always has torsion, this quotient, uh, uh, th this quotient is uh, topologically a three manifold if you just think of it as a quotient space, but in fact it has extra structure coming from the images of the uh, fixed point sets of non-trivial elements um, of, the, of the group. And uh, so that, that it turns out to mean it's a, it's a three manifold decorated with a certain graph, and it's an example of what's called a hyperbolic three orbifold. So it has some finite sheeted uh, well, orbifold cover, which is really a branch cover in the, in the top a lot, in the category of manifolds, and that's a genuine hyperbolic manifold. So that would correspond to a, a finite index uh, torsion-free subgroup of, of this, uh, of this lattice. Okay. So this I'm sorry? Ah, uh, okay, good. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's an important point. So, yeah, so in fact, it's, it's compact, uh, if and only if, the degree of k over the rational numbers is greater than two. And, and so in, in the case of degree two, you have these quadratic, uh, the, these are just gonna be a uh, quotient of H3 by, these are just gonna be Bianchi groups, which are subgroups of SL2 of the integers of a, of a, um, of an imaginary quadratic field, which are automatically automatically discrete. And, and th this is really the case that I'll always be interested in because all the questions I'm going to be talking about turn out to be fairly easy to answer in the degree two case. Uh, so, okay, so, so uh, let, let me just write down. So the definition of an arithmetic group, uh, well, an arithmetic, uh, let's say an arithmetic subgroup of of PGL2C, and I guess it's a definition that makes sense only up to conjugacy. So, um, <coughs> so it's a subgroup which is uh, commensurate with gamma O0, uh, well, for some, um, Okay, so just let me just repeat all the words here. Okay, just I think there's, I think it's worth seeing them again. So for for some field k, uh, some number field k with a unique complex place, and some uh, say division quaternion algebra b 
over k ramified at every real place and, and for some maximal order. As I say, these are natural objects from the number theoretic point of view. I've already pointed out that they have connection with uh, <coughs> the geometry. And the uh, study of these things, uh, well, at least from my point of view, maybe was gotten off the ground by, by Borel. Who proved that? Uh, well, I guess it's up to conjugacy. Uh, so suppose we're given a positive number v up to conjugacy, there are only, or at most, finitely many um, yeah, uh, finitely many arithmetic subgroups. Gamma of uh, PGL2C such that, well, the covolume of gamma, which would be the, the volume of, um, of uh, say, H3 minus gamma, it still has a well defined volume, even if it's an orbifold, you can think of it as the volume of a fundamental domain, is less than or equal to V. <coughs> So the question is, of course, uh, what are they for a given v? And that's what I mean by enumeration. So uh, Borel's proof uh, goes pretty far towards answering this question. Uh, but uh, as I'll be explaining in just a second, there's a geometric, uh, so he, he the, the, the proof of this is partly number theoretic, but at one point he uses, he uses a geometric uh, argument. And uh, uh, it turns out that um, if, you want to, if you want to do this enumeration in practice for some you know, reasonable looking number v, then uh, the arithmetic part uh, is often uh, quite doable. And the geometric part turns out to be very challenging. Uh, Chinberg and Friedman actually showed you could give a purely number theoretic proof of this, which means in principle there's a purely number theoretic way of doing this enumeration. But, but uh, in fact, uh, it very quickly becomes uh, absolutely impossible to, to implement because of the complexity. And so, uh, so, so for example, uh, they were able to prove, I mean, this, is, this was subsumed in later later work about three manifolds, but it's nevertheless uh, significant that they could do this by purely number theoretic methods, is that, uh, that there's only one, there's only one of these things when uh, V is, I think, uh, 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 0. Uh, uh, 0.041, I think. And the, the volume, the co-volume of that turns out to be about 0.339, so that's the smallest arithmetic, um, smallest volume arithmetic orbifold. And, and what is the degree of infinity? Is it clear how many of them you get approximately? Oh, ah, well that's very interesting because I think there's some recent work about that by Lobotsky and uh, a couple of co-authors. Yeah. Do you remember what Pardon? Do you remember no, 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 I don't. But I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's the opposite of what I'm doing. So they're doing the asymptotic thing and I'm doing it at the other end where you have a an actual bound. Sorry? Oh. And, and by the way, their, their work is n-dimensional, but yeah, it's, it's completely complementary to this. Neither seems to shed any light on the other. <coughs> so, um, Uh, oh, okay, so I wanted to spend a couple of minutes explaining the, uh, uh, the strategy of uh, Borel's proof because it actually gives us an approach to, uh, to, a, uh, to this kind of question.
Uh, so uh, without trying to explain this in any detail at all, let me just say uh, Borel shows that it's enough to enumerate lattices of a special type. Uh, lattices of the form gamma sub O. Now this is not the same as gamma sub O zero, which I've defined. <coughs> so gamma O, if you know, if we have a given quaternion algebra, given maximal order, and so on, uh, gamma O uh, means the image in PGL2C, well, not of O star but of the normalizer of O star in B star. So that's a bigger group in general. It contains, it contains O star with, with finite index. And in fact, uh, if I have it right, this is actually, a, this, is a, this one in particular is a maximal arithmetic group, but not all maximal ones have this form. <coughs> but through some complicated procedure, which I won't try to summarize, uh, he shows that if you want to enumerate all the lattices of at most a given volume, it's enough to look at ones of this special, of this special type. Um, well, on the other hand, there is another type of lattice which can be enumerated by purely number theoretic methods. So namely, uh, let's define uh, gamma O1 to be... Uh, uh, this will be the, uh, the elements of norm 1. I'll explain in a second what that means, at least in this case. In, uh, oops, sorry. Again, I should say the image of the set of elements. The image of, uh, well, let's call it o, O1, which is the set of elements of norm 1 in, uh, in O star. Of course, this is a subgroup of O star if a norm behaves multiplicatively, which it does. But since I haven't defined the norm in general, let me just say what, let me give you a, a quick definition in the case we're, we're talking about. So I'm talking about, remember, in particular, I'm always looking at fields that have exactly one complex place. So up to complex conjugation, they're actually canonically identified with <coughs> subgroups of C, and so uh, O star then is, is canonically identified with a subgroup of, uh, of um, PSL, uh, PGL, PGL2C. Uh, oops, sorry, GL2C, right, before I, before I divide out, that's the point. And, and so the norm Actually, I could, I could, maybe it's better to say B is identified with a, with a subalgebra of M2 of C. That's really what I should have said. So the, the norm of an element of B is simply its determinant. And I guess it's a real number, so it doesn't change when you do complex conjugation. So it's just a, a minor, mi minor difference, I would say, between O and O star, as opposed to a major difference between gamma, gamma O and uh, gamma O zero. I think it's real. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd rather not think about it now, but I think it's, I think it's easy. I think, think of it as being like the norm of a Hamiltonian quaternion, okay? I think it's real for basically the same reason. <coughs> All right, so... Um, oh, okay, so, 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 uh, so these are the things... The, these, are, these are the things... Uh, if, if, you're, if you're looking at... Um, if you're looking, it's an, we really want to understand lattices of this type, and these are the lattices that it's easy to enumerate number theoretically. And just to give you a hint about why that's easy, let me just mention uh, Borel's volume formula, which I won't write down completely. 
but I'll write down part of it just to give you a just to give you the flavor. So, <coughs> so if we look at the volume of uh, of gamma O1, well, I guess I should call it the co-volume since it's a group. That's equal to a uh, factor involving the number field k and a factor that really depends on the quaternion algebra. You might think it would depend on the, on the maximal order as well, but it just so happens that it doesn't. So, but let me, let me tell you what the factor involving k is. Uh, it's, it's, it's something just involving standard number theoretic stuff. So we take the, uh, the zeta function of the field k, evaluate it at 2, and then we take the discriminant of the field k, and we raise that to the 3 halves power, and then we divide by 2 pi to the power uh, 2 uh, nk minus 2. nk just means the degree of the field k over q. Okay, so this is all very, the point is this is all very standard number theoretic stuff. And uh, this one, this factor is greater than or equal to 1. And by the way, this, this factor is also greater than or equal to 1. So that means that if, if the co-volume of gamma 0, 1, gamma, excuse me, gamma 0, 1 is, uh, is less than or equal to V, then... It, it, it follows, in fact, that this other, that this factor, uh, gamma k, sorry, not gamma k, but uh, delta k to the 3 halves divided by 2 pi to the 2nk minus 2 is also less than or equal to v. Well, that's a number theoretic condition on the field. It turns out there are only finally many fields that satisfy that. And, and in, within reasonable ranges, it actually is possible to to enumerate them. So that means you can figure out what all the possible fields can be. Using this factor, you figure out what all the possible quaternion algebras can be, and then you can actually, you can actually go, go ahead. But notice that's only if the co-volume of, uh, of this gadget is less than or equal to k, we really want to, uh, is less than or equal to v. We really want to know what happens if, uh, if the uh, co-volume of, uh, of gamma O is less than or equal to V. And of course the, uh, the, the co-volume, the, the problem is that the co-volume of gamma O1 is not equal to this, it's equal to, uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's, it's in general a lot bigger than this because it's the, it's the co-volume of um, of gamma O times the index of, uh, uh, of gamma O1 in gamma O. So, uh, so, so basically, if you, have, if you have an upper bound for, uh, for this, and you, you'd like to have an upper bound for this, so you could apply this, this stuff, it means you have to bound this. And that's, that's, where, that's the step that can really in practice really only be done geometrically. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, so it turns out that gamma, that this, uh, uh, that this quotient group, this is a normal subgroup, it's easy to see, and in fact the quotient group is, uh, is an elementary two group. So in other words, it's just the additive group of a, of a vector space over Z mod two, elementary abelian two group. It's just a sum of a, you know, a direct product of Z mod 2s. And, uh, and what, so what you need to, you need a, good, need a good estimate for its rank. So I gather Ch Chinberg and Friedman can give you a terrible estimate for its rank, but we want a good one. And this has a lot to do with uh, topology now because the fact that it's a quotient, so, so gamma, gamma O1, uh, excuse me, gamma O rather, is the fundamental group of, uh, of some three-dimensional orbifold, okay? 
Well, of course, if, if you're used to thinking about manifolds, as I am, then you know that when you take the quotient of H3 by, uh, by, by a discrete torsion-free group, the uh, fundamental group of the resulting thing is, uh, is equal to the group you started with. Well, there is a definition of fundamental group for an orbifold, and the same fact carries over. So, so here, uh, uh, omega is H, uh, H3 mod, mod gamma O, but we have to take the fundamental group as an orbifold. So this is the, the orbifold, orbifold pi 1. I won't try to write that in Hebrew. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So that gives us the um, right, right. So, so what that means now is that uh, that this 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 group whose rank we're trying to bound is uh, is actually a quotient of. Well, the group that you get by abelianizing this and then uh, tensoring it with Z mod 2. So that would be the orbifold H1 of omega Z mod 2. So now the question becomes... Uh, uh, the problem now becomes, so finally we have a geometric problem now, uh, a find a good upper bound for H1 of omega Z mod 2. Well, omega in the application will be arithmetic, but in fact you can ask this for any hyperbolic orbifold. So again, I should say the dimension of this. Uh, in terms of an upper bound for the volume. Or the co-volume, well, yeah, no, the volume of omega. Well, there, there's a kind of an astonishing coincidence that happens now because <coughs> because uh, in the case of a manifold, it just so happens that uh, Mark Culler and I and our collaborators have been working for a couple of decades now on a problem that's very similar to this, except it's for, uh, it's for manifolds. And our motivation always was, well, we were thinking about Moscow rigidity and trying to understand it uh, explicitly. So you sometimes call this quantitative Mostar rigidity. You have a, uh, if, if, you take a, if you take a hyperbolic manifold, it follows from Mostar rigidity that it's, uh, that, that the volume is a topological invariant, and the question is how can you relate that to more, uh, you know, to, 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 to topological invariants that are, that are better understood from the purely topological point of view, such as, such as homology. And it turns out that it was known that there's some linear upper bound for the, for the dimension of H1 in terms of the volume, uh, but the, the known coefficients are, again, not, they're, 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 they're much bigger than they ought to be. So what, what we've been doing is sometimes we, we can show that if we take a mm, sort of middle-sized uh, uh, upper bound for the, for the rank of, of, of the, uh, I mean for the volume, then we can get uh, uh, then we can get a, a, a really quite good, uh, almost sometimes sharp or close to sharp bound for, for, the <coughs> for the rank of H1, and it turns out that it, it, it often works best with mod 2 coefficients. So that's, that's kind of a cool coincidence, and the only trouble is that uh, our results don't apply directly to orbifolds. So just to give you the flavor of these results, I want to write down a, a couple of examples. So uh, first one is, oh, okay, well, let me, yeah, okay. So uh, if, um, so, so let's say M is a hyperbolic, uh, let's just say closed for simplicity. As I say, that's really the case that one needs to focus on here. 
So just to keep things simple, I'll assume that and orientable. So it really is a quotient by quotient of hyperbolic space by a, a subgroup of uh, P, PGL2C as opposed to something involving <coughs> reflections. <coughs> um, orientable, three manifold, right? Uh, so if so, statement one. Uh, so this is uh, this was proved by Agol and uh, Color and myself. Uh, if uh, if the volume of M is at most 1.22, then then the dimension of H1 is, with Z2 coefficients is less than or equal to uh, three. Uh, interestingly enough, if uh, if you if you put an odd prime here instead of z2, in this case you actually do better. You can get a bound of two, and that one actually is sharp. The Weeks manifold realizes this. So this is this is a a variant of a it's and it's it's almost sharp, and it's a variant of a sharp result. And uh, using a lot of deep techniques, which Mark and I and others have been uh, developing for many years. Um, second. Uh, Let's see, I guess this was proved, this was proved by Color and myself, uh, uh, well, using lots of, lots of things, but in particular using the results of, in an earlier paper by Anderson Canary, Color and myself, but with lots and lots of new topology in particular, three-dimensional topology. Uh, so we proved that if, um, if the volume uh, if the volume is at most uh, 3.08, then, then the dimension of H1 of M uh, with Z2 coefficients is at most, um, is at most 5. Uh, and I, I'm going to say a few words about this just to illustrate all the stuff that goes into these <coughs> results, because they, they really are results with a lot of content to them. Um, so this is also by color and myself uh, using well using a different paper with with Abel. Uh, so it's a little bit like this, only much harder. So the, if the volume is at most three point four four. Well, that, that's a serious difference because there's actually a gigantic number of, number of manifolds with volumes in between these two. Of course, nobody knows how many, but we know there are lots. If we knew all of them, then this wouldn't be interesting. Okay. Uh, the dimension of H1 with Z2 coefficients is at most, is at most 7. All right, so... <coughs> Uh, yeah, so, so let me just, without writing down anything, let me just say a few words for the purposes of illustration about what goes into the proof of this statement, too. So you want to assume that, the, that this dimension has, is at least 6, and then you want to prove that this volume is bigger than 3.08. Well, the first thing we do is some very, very hard topology. It's like a, a hugely souped-up version of the proof of... Uh, Dane's lemma, but it uses almost everything that's been done in three-dimensional topology since then. Uh, what we prove is that if the dimension of this is at least six, then, <coughs> then one of two things happens. Either every three-generator subgroup, uh, every, either every three-generator subgroup of pi one of m is free, or there's an incompressible surface of genus two. Incompressible just means that its fundamental group injects closed surface of genus 2 inside the manifold whose fundamental group injects. And there are completely different proofs in those two cases. So in the case where every three-generator subgroup is free, you use, uh, well, you use the result that was proved here, which depends on uh, uh, Banach-Tarski type decomposition of the Patterson-Sullivan measure and, uh, and the uh, solution to the Martin conjecture by Egel and caligari gabay uh, and what you, what you get is, uh, in that case, when, and, and you need to combine that with a study of a certain, uh, the nerve of a covering of hyperbolic space by cylinders and lots of interesting sort of combinatorial uh, 
algebraic topology that goes in there, what you end up proving is that in that case, there's actually a ball of radius log 5 over 2 in the manifold. That has volume, I think, about 2.4, but then using bounds due to Berichke and Florian on the density of a sphere packing in hyperbolic space, that turns out to imply that the Dirichlet domain has volume at least 3.08. In the other case, you use completely different methods. You have this genus 2 incompressible surface. Uh, then there's a result of, uh, of um, uh, uh, Egel, Storm, and Thurston. That's, uh, that's Bill Thurston, uh, which, uh, which gives you a lower bound um, for the volume in terms of data involving the, the characteristic submanifold of the complementary pieces of this surface. And what you get there is that either there's a, either there's a lower bound of about 3.66, which is of course bigger than this, and that's the volume of a, um, a regular ideal hyperbolic octahedron in H3. Uh, Uh, or, 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 or else, the, or else the, the manifold is of a very special type. The surface is what's called a fibroid. And in that case, in fact, you can show that the dimension is at most five. So I said all those words just to illustrate. Well, I wanted to illustrate a couple of things. One is, one is that there's a lot of really serious math that goes in here. And therefore, I think it would be remarkable to apply this to number theory. And, and the other thing is that people always ask me, where do all these wacky numbers come from? So I wanted to say a word about that. Uh, okay, but so that's, that's, that's what's known. It's not exactly what we need if we really want to study these arithmetic groups. So what I've been doing is working on a program to, uh, to do uh, corresponding things for, uh, for or orbifolds. And uh, th this is work in progress. So there's going to be a, an awkward hypothesis here, which I hope I'm in the process of removing. But again, I don't want to lie to you, so I'll tell you what hypotheses I, I need so far. So, uh, so proposition, so let's let uh, omega be a closed hyperbolic, uh, well, orientable three orbifold. Uh, for, for, so far, I need to assume, and this is, a, this is too strong an assumption for the purpose of arithmetic groups, but it, I think it would be good to have a result even in this case. So suppose that, well, for the experts, let me just say the singular set is a link. The singular set, as I said, is the image in omega of the set of all fixed points of non-trivial elements of, of the group. And in general, it's uh, at most a trivalent graph. So I'm assuming that we don't have any nodes. So it's a link. So if, if you don't want to think about, look at the actual picture of the orbifold, you can say it this way. If omega is h3 mod gamma, this means that all the finite subgroups, all the finite subgroups of uh, of gamma are cyclic. It happens for many interesting examples of hyperbolic orbifolds, but they tend not to be these maximal arithmetic things. So it's a, again, that's, that's a hypothesis. It's not, it's not the awkward hypothesis, but it is a hypothesis that one eventually hopes to eliminate. Uh, let's see, I think, question? Yes. Oh, thank you. OK, I think that's, that'll just about work. Um, Uh, I think I'm ready for the awkward hypothesis. Oh, um, and so now, uh, so, so the awkward hypothesis, is, I'm just recording this for the purpose of full disclosure. Uh, so far, as I say, I hope I'm in the process of eliminating this, is that uh, no two-sheeted, orbifold covering of omega has 
a, a connected sum end which is homeomorphic to either S2 cross S1 or a non-trivial lens space. Okay. okay, so under all these assumptions, if, if the volume of omega is at most 1.72, which of course you'll recognize as being one half of 3.44, there's a two-sheeted covering involved in this, uh, then, uh, well, again, uh, the, the conclusion is, is a lot weaker than I would hope, but uh, I'm hoping to improve this, but for, for now what I get is that the dimension of H1 with mod 2 coefficients is at most 31. <coughs> so maybe the, maybe the thing I should emphasize most about this proof is the following. If you take... If you take a, an orbifold, I mentioned before that its underlying space is, uh, is a manifold. Uh, the manifold may or may not be hyperbolic. Okay, so let's pretend for the moment that it is. And let's also pretend that in this hypothesis, instead of having Orbifold homology, which we do, I should emphasize this is orbifold homology, suppose we just had the ordinary homology of this as a topological space, as a manifold. <coughs> well, in that, in that sort of imaginary world, if that were the case, which it's not, but if that were the case, then... Uh, that then, then actually this would have a, there, there would be a much stronger result along these lines which would be much, much easier to prove because we would only need to say, well, let's say the volume of that is at most 3.44. Uh, it's, it's, it's a classical by now fact, I guess, due to Gromov, that the volume of hyperbolic, of the, the, um, if, if, if you take, say, an orbifold whose underlying manifold happens to be hyperbolic, let's just stick with that case, then the volume of that hyperbolic manifold is less than or equal to the volume of the, of the hyperbolic orbifold. So that would mean your underlying manifold would have volume at most 3.44. And, and then by this result, you would get a bound of seven, uh, well, uh, for the, for the, admittedly for the wrong object, because I was pretending we could confuse the two. So all the difficulty is involved in getting around that. What you first need to do is you take some Smith theory, use some Smith theory to get a two-sheeted cover such that the manifold homology of the two-sheeted cover is related in a suitable way to the orbifold homology of the manifold downstairs. Again, then if, the, if, that, if that volume, that, that orbi if the given orbifold has volume at most 1.72, then that manifold uh, has... Uh, uh, it, it actually has a manifold homology of, well, sorry, okay, so I'm, I guess I'm rushing, but, but the point is that, that the, the, uh, the, the volume, the hyperbolic volume of that, uh, the orbifold volume of that two-sheeted cover would then be at most 3.44 if the original one were at most 1.72. And, uh, and, and then, then again, you could, you, could, you, could do, you could do something here. Uh, the problem, the real difficulty lies in the case where that covering is, where that underlying manifold of the two-sheeted cover is not hyperbolic, then you need to use Perelman uh, to get the uh, a ge geometric decomposition of that, and then you look very carefully, and this is where all the combinatorial stuff comes in, at, you have various ways of estimating the volumes of the pieces, the, the volumes in a suitable sense of the pieces into which it's divided by, by spheres and uh, and tori, and then you use an orbifold version of the result of Egel, Storm, and Thurston, which I mentioned before, and, and you get this kind of result. Okay, so that's most I have time to say. <laughs>